All right, we got some more bad news on the state of the housing sector today. Single family starts tumbling more than 10 percent, while a full 16 plus percent of homes that went under contract in July were canceled. That's the highest number ever on record, with the exception of the early days of the pandemic. Or we, as the National Association of Home Builders said, in a housing recession. Danielle Hale is Realtor.com's chief economist. Nice to see you. What did you make of that statement and all the data we've seen pouring in the last two days? Well, it's clear that home builders are pulling, pulling back. Um, they've been uh, building at a frenzied pace. The housing market itself has been operating at a, as a frenzied pace through most of the pandemic. But the fact that mortgage rates have moved significantly higher over the course of the year is being felt by home buyers and now home sellers, including builders, are starting to feel it too. There's a rebalancing going on in the housing market, and that means a pullback from the heights of activity that we saw uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Danielle, do you expect this pullback to continue? And I guess how long until we see more of a correction in the housing market? Uh, that's an interesting question. So builders right now have a record or very close to record high number of homes under construction. So there's a lot of pipeline that is still yet to come through the system. We're going to see plenty of supply then from new construction. We are also seeing on the existing home side, the number of listings tick up. So home shoppers in today's market have lots of options. That's taking away some of the sense of urgency that they felt over the past couple of years when the number of homes for sale was very scarce and they needed to act quickly. Couple that with the fact that we've got a bit of stability in mortgage rates over the past couple months as the bond market has been a bit more stable. And that means we're likely to see the housing market kind of move sideways as buyers and sellers figure out where they can meet in the middle over the next few months. Will be an interesting time to watch. All right, Realtor.com is out with new data on the hottest zip codes in America right now. A fascinating top 10. Let's first talk about a region that really stands out here. It appears to be New England. Tell us about some of those markets and why you think New England has stood out. Yeah, well, in an environment where prices are going up, mortgage rates are going up, buyers are facing higher costs, they're really looking for affordability. And the fact that they've got more flexibility than they've had in the past means they can go beyond the suburbs all the way out into these smaller towns. And New England is really where we're where they're finding those smaller towns where they can get good real estate bang for the buck, but not be too far away from big cities like Boston and New York and even Washington, D.C. in some cases. And in these markets, Thanks to this influx of home shoppers, homes are selling quickly and they're getting a lot of views from shoppers on Realtor.com. So that's keeping those housing markets relatively competitive, even though in a broad sense, we are seeing a housing cool down nationwide. Danielle, what about Worthington, Ohio, one of the cities that's obviously not in the Northeast? What do you think it is about that zip code that's attracting so much attention? So Columbus metro area, which is where you'll find the Worthington zip code, um, is a very affordable region. You've got great quality of life there between the state capital and the Ohio State University. And that's attracting a lot of home shoppers. Because that area is more affordable as a whole and has good job opportunities, the Worthington zip code kind of bucks the trend a little bit. It's more expensive than its surrounding metro. But because Columbus is so affordable, buyers are still feeling like they can get a good deal in that Worthington area. And so that's propelling it to the top of the list. Though top on the list came in as a big surprise, at least to this guy, Brighton, New York, nowhere near New York City. Um, what makes it stand out? And largely when you look at this top 10, does this give you a pretty good indication that work from home is here to stay? Yes, I think that people are taking advantage of work from home. So Brighton, New York, as you mentioned, is the number one zip code on the list. Um, it's in the Rochester area. It's, a, it's about 10 minutes or so from downtown. It is one of the most affordable zips on the top 10 list. So the median home price in that zip code is under $300,000, which is a great steal. It's not necessarily a commute distance from, say, New York City if you're going into the office every day of the week or even a couple times a week. But if you're going in once a month, maybe a couple times a quarter, um, that is a real great way to get um, some value for your real estate dollar by relocating to Brighton, where, as I mentioned, the, the median home price is under $300,000. I also have to shout out number six on the list, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's home of my alma mater, <laughs> Lehigh University. But Danielle, when you talk about the changing trends that we're seeing in the real estate landscape and the priorities that people are placing when they are now hunting for a home, is this something that you think 
is here to stay because we are seeing more and more companies demand that their that their workers return to the office. Yeah, so I do think that flexibility is around to stay, um, even though companies are wanting workers back in the office more frequently. The fact that it's become so expensive to find a home and to make and meet in some of these biggest cities means workers are trying to find uh, that flexibility where they can. And the jobs market remains competitive. So um, offering flexibility is a great, very low cost way. And in some cases, maybe even there will be some cost savings for companies that offer this flexibility. Um, to give workers what they want and compete without necessarily having to increase the bottom line. Well, last week was a tough one for housing market data amid rising mortgage rates and recession fears. We saw builder sentiment for single family homes slump and another key survey showed home builder cancellation rates doubling since April. So are we in a housing recession? Joining us now is Christopher Meyer, Paul Milstein, professor of real estate at the Columbia Business School. Uh, great to have you on the program today. Uh, Christopher, tell us about kind of how you're viewing the housing market dynamics right now. Uh, supply, if it's coming down, might mean that prices would remain elevated despite some of the steam that we've seen taken out broadly. Yeah. Um, hey, Brian, thanks for having me. Um, I would say first, it's definitely going to take, you know, the rising rates are taking a lot of the steam out of the housing market. Um, there may be a little bit of steam left, but not a lot. So I do think we are going to see, and we're already seeing home prices slow, um, the growth to near zero across the country. And in, you know, some of the hotter markets, you know, we're starting to see prices fall a little bit, which is not surprising given what we saw over the previous, uh, over the previous couple of years. Now, at the same time, you know, all of those things might point to a slowdown in the housing market. But a lot of people who were wondering, eh, is this going to bring the affordability of homes down to a level where I can actually get into the market here? How does this compare to what we've seen in previous cycles? Because it seems like, by and large, you're still seeing a relatively hot housing market, depending on where specifically geographically you might be looking, right? Right. So in many, in, you know, from an affordability perspective, this might be almost the worst time you could buy because mortgage rates have spiked um, quite a bit. We're back at the level they were, you know, in 2009. So we're talking 13 years ago was the last time mortgage rates were this high. Um, but at the same time, home prices and sellers are still hoping to get for their home what they would have gotten three or six months ago. And so, you know, as a buyer, part of the reason you're seeing can't, you know, contracts cancel and, you know, homes sitting on the market, you know, starting to sit a lot longer is buyers are looking at this and saying, well, at these rates, I don't want to pay these prices or I can't afford to pay these prices and sellers are still sticking. And that makes it a tough time to be a buyer right now. Uh, now, how about for a renter? Because we've seen anecdotes. I mean, you know, we're both in New York City and we don't need to talk to too many people to realize just how brutal it is out there to rent. How do the higher mortgage rates and the state of the housing market also bleed into the dynamics that we're seeing for people that don't have the capital to buy a house and all and don't have any other choice but to rent? So I think the housing market is really segmented quite a bit from the rental market. So people who are looking for, you know, for houses or, you know, for apartments to rent in New York, interest rates, movements in the housing market aren't impacting them at all. But I will say that for, you know, some of the same reasons we're seeing the economy slow down, we've seen, you know, households under a lot of pressure because, you know, oil prices have gone up a lot, even if they kind of started to come in a bit, you know, food, other parts of inflation are high. We're definitely seeing sort of demand for rents start to soften a little bit. So it's not saying that rents are going to fall anytime soon. Um, but it does suggest that I think rental growth rates are also starting to slow for some of the same reasons um, that we're seeing the housing market also start to slow. Uh, now, kind of shifting back to the housing market itself, are you seeing any sort of, I mean, obviously demand still remains strong, but you know, one interesting thread that we have been talking about through the post-pandemic period was the inclusion of a lot of institutional buyers, right? A lot of attention, for example, on BlackRock going into some neighborhoods and then snatching up properties. Is that still something that you're observing here? What's the scale of that? How significant is it? You know, there were markets where, you know, 30, 35%, even 40% of home purchases um, were being um, done by investors some of whom were looking to rent, many of whom were just looking to flip so-called iBuyers um, in the market. 
I think those people are going to have a lot of trouble. Um, even during the best of times, I buyers were barely able to make a buck when home prices were going up 15% a year or more. And I think those, you know, those buyers are going to have houses on the market that are going to be, you know, coming back at a discount. So I do think some of those institutional buyers are going to face challenges in the market, trying to get rid of them. But I don't think that's going to make it a buyer's market from a, uh, you know, from a homeowner, you know, from somebody aspiring homeowner perspective, because they're still facing, you know, really high mortgage rates relative to what they were before. So net net, I think that it's just going to be a tough market for almost anybody who's looking to sell right now. But it's also a tough market for people looking to buy, which is, you know, not a great not a great time for housing. Steady stream of evidence showing a cooling housing sector continues to flow today with news that new home sales dropped 12.6% to their lowest levels since 2016 and also down nearly 30% from a year ago. Where is this market headed? Daryl Fairweather is the Redfin chief economist and insider contributor. Good to see you, Daryl. So are we seeing any signs of flattening down the road or can we expect these numbers to continue to fall as long as the Fed is tightening? I expect prices to continue to fall for the rest of the year because mortgage rates are so high and home buyers simply can't afford their monthly payments. Monthly payments are up about 40% from last year. So it's really hard for, for buyers to stomach that. And in terms of the new listings also falling, what does that tell us? Is that that some of these sellers are perhaps waiting for the market to go back up or is it an inventory issue? Sellers are sitting on record equity gains from last year and they locked into very low mortgage rates last year. So it's not really a good reason for homeowners to sell right now, especially when they see that the market is soft. They can just hold on and wait. Also, the lending standards of the last decade were really strict. So homeowners are in a really good financial position, even with inflation in the economy and all of that. We're not going to see very many distressed sales because the kind of people who own homes are in a good financial position. Joe, you mentioned the fact that you do expect prices to continue to fall. Some economists out there are saying that home prices are likely to plunge. Do you think that's exaggerated or how big of a drop are you expecting to see? I think that's unlikely unless we enter into a pretty severe recession. Like I said, homeowners are in a good financial position. They have plenty of equity, they have a big cushion. You'd really need to see a wave of distressed sales to get to a point where prices drop because sellers and homeowners can just wait out this market. So you have a pullback in both demand and supply and prices stay stable even though sales are way down. The maddening situation for Home buyers, as you're seeing, we showed it earlier, the median price right now, 439, that is up $37,000 a month ago. So we're seeing numbers fall, uh, but not if you want to get back in this game. We're hearing also, Daryl, that we are in a housing recession. Expert after expert coming out with that statement. What does it mean for home buyers and for homeowners? I think housing recession is a bit of hyperbole. This is a normal part of the housing cycle. We just had a really hot period and you know what goes up must come down eventually. That happens throughout the house. That happens in the housing market every so often. It happened in 2018 even. It didn't last very long. I think the question is how long is this going to last? And that really depends on the economy. How long is inflation going to stick around? How long is the Fed going to have to raise interest rates to fight that inflation? Is it going to be so bad that we go into a recession? That's what I'm waiting to see is what happens in the economy because what's happening in the housing market isn't all that unusual compared to how hot it was just a couple of months ago. And Daryl, given how much people moved around during the pandemic, which areas are seeing faster recovery than others right now? Well, the Midwest is really stable. When everybody was moving around, it was mostly from the expensive coastal areas like San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, to the Sun Belts like Florida, Texas, Arizona. Those Sun Belt areas, they went up really fast. And now that mortgage rates have gone up, they are correcting really quickly. Some of the homeowners there got over ambitious when it came to pricing, and they're having to learn the hard way that they have to lower prices in order to sell. So that's why we're seeing a lot of price drops in those areas and not as many home sales. The the Bay Area, Los Angeles, those markets are still really expensive and remote work is still an option for people. So a lot of people would rather just move somewhere else or rent for another year than to buy a home 
in a place that has million dollar homes where that extra mortgage interest rate could raise your monthly payment by up to $1,000. Now the Midwest is just stable. They didn't go up that much during the pandemic and there's not there's not really anywhere to fall because they've just been so stable. I think we had a bit of an issue there with the shot. Is Daryl still with us? Had one more question. I'm here, if you can hear me. Great, had one more question for you because the problem underlying all of this is lack of inventory. And you have an interesting piece out about the simple fix for that relates to taxing, stop taxing housing. Tell, tell us more about this and why it would work. So one thing that defines building new housing is the tax structure. We tax housing, meaning that an apartment building that has 10 units in it is going to get taxed more than a single family home. So will the apartment building, if you can just hold on to that single family home and not have to pay higher taxes. The way to get around this is to tax the land instead of the property because the land doesn't change. And this is an efficient tax because it doesn't discourage investment. We can More evidence today of what many see as a housing rental crisis in this country rents hitting a record high in july for the 17th consecutive month the national median rent hit a new record high of one thousand eight hundred seventy nine dollars that's up 12 percent according to realtor.com and shana this is not simply a big city problem any longer it certainly is not there's actually new data out from realtor.com really showing how much rental prices have increased in the suburbs relative to what we're seeing play out in the big cities. You're not going to get the discount that maybe you would have before the pandemic. So pre-pandemic, a suburban renter paid $175 less compared to someone in the city. That gap is now down to $107. So certainly we have seen this mass exodus from many of our big cities over the last couple of years because of the pandemic. So Rochelle, it really puts buyers and renters now forcing more people to rent because people simply can't buy those homes that they want to purchase in the suburbs. So you have more and more people settling for rents and we're seeing that obviously have a huge impact on the rental prices in suburbs today. And we've had several analysts say, look, a lot of people are stuck between a rock and a hard place. The mortgage rates continue to rise, but then you're also seeing these rents hitting a record high. We've even seen in Sedona some instances of a lot of people who bought houses to rent them out as Airbnbs. Some of these cities now asking them instead to use them as long-term rentals for locals because there just isn't the supply. And you would think with some of these prices coming down on commodities like lumber, we would begin to see more home building, but that doesn't seem to still be the case. So I think this is gonna be a tight squeeze for a while. You mentioned mortgage rates, and that's a big deal here because a lot of those renters that want to get off the sidelines today saw mortgage rates go up from 513 to 555 up nearly a half point and that's a huge reason that they're going to have to stay in the rental situation i'll give you one bit of good news some data just came out under the radar a couple of days ago that showed we will build 420,000 apartments this year that marks the first time since 1972 that the united states will build 400,000 plus apartments in back-to-back -back years. So at least there is more inventory coming on the market that should help at least keep those numbers flat, if not bring them down a little bit. And I've talked to a lot of developers, Shana, who are saying they're actually building developments now with the intent not to sell those homes, small houses that they intend to rent because of these escalating rates. Yeah, there certainly is an opportunity here. Obviously, we've been waiting for more supply to come onto the market. I think the big question is what it's going to look like over the next couple of months, right? Until we get that Awful. supply, until the, until home builders are able to build and in order to give a potential buyer some more options. So Rochelle, it seems like the housing market is cooling. Certainly all the data points that we've gotten over the last couple of weeks point to that. The question is just how quickly we could see the housing market cool. And I think that obviously has massive implications, not only for what we see play out in that industry, but also for the economy overall. And we have to keep in mind, it obviously is cooling regionally. Certain areas really didn't see much growth. We had an analyst saying, look, in the, in the Midwest, with some prices really didn't budge much at all. But if you're one of these people who perhaps wanted to go somewhere warm, you wanted to go to Florida, you wanted to go to some of the coasts, they're now seeing a reversal. So it's, it's definitely an interesting space to watch, but I know regionally some people are still struggling, but- New obviously. housing numbers just released suggest it's getting tougher to sell your house. Redfin says it now takes 
23 days on average, a historically low number, albeit one that's been ticking up steadily in recent months. For more on the housing market and where we're headed, we welcome in Crystal Moore, CEO of Pacific Shore Capital, and Kenny Simpson, the Simpson Team Mortgage Advisor. Together they are the hosts of Get in the Cash Flow Game. Nice to see you both. Crystal, we'll start with you. Homes are still moving, but do you see this dynamic shifting in favor of buyers today? I think we're on mute there, if you can hit that button. Can you hear us, guys? Yes. Yep. There we go. Go ahead. Start from the beginning, if you would. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're definitely seeing a shift from a seller's market to a buyer's market, and we've been seeing that for at least a few months now. So now is the time where buyers can actually ask for more. Uh, we're not having to ask for, you know, no contingencies going in and, and you know, going over lists. We're not seeing those things happening anymore. So buyers definitely do have the upper hand. Kenny, if you're going to the negotiating right, right to the table right now, buyers having the upper hand, what do you need to know if you're a seller? Because certainly it seems like this market is changing on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, I was uh, walking one day and I came up with this concept. You know, the sellers want the price of yesterday and the buyers want the price of tomorrow, right? So this gap is slowly closing here. And so if you're a seller and you're listing your property and you're being unrealistic, it's just gonna sit there. And buyers know that, they're smart. You know, there's so much media now. So you're either gonna get a low ball offer or you're just gonna sit there. Uh, a lot of data has been pouring out day after day, really showing a pullback or a cooling of this market. Mark Zandi in particular, chief economist at Moody's, he says housing is, quote, struggling. Home sales have cratered. Crystal, step back 30,000 foot. Where do you see this housing market headed? Is it headed for a crash or just a, a slight pullback? You know, I can see where he's coming from, but uh, my personal opinion is that we're not going to see this massive drop in home prices. Part of that is the fact that there, we have such a shortage of housing. So we've also never had so many young people coming into the housing market that want to purchase homes today. So that's why we're in a little bit of a different situation than we were in the last recession, where that was more of a financial crash. This time around, we have good financing. It's conservative. Not everybody can get a loan. And we've got this influx of new buyers coming into the market that we didn't have the last cycle. Kenny, home prices that are coming down a bit, how big of a drop are we seeing? How big of a drop could we potentially see over the next couple of months? Yeah, so like depends on where you are, right? So for example, we're sitting here in San Diego, California. We always have an inventory problem, right? And we're just not there. But if you look at places like Utah or Arizona, Texas, Florida, they're just getting more, you know, homes listed on the market. So it's really determined. I think it's going to be more city by city, state by state. So you might see a bigger housing correction in Utah or Phoenix than San Diego or Los Angeles, because we just don't have the inventory. And so what could you see? You could see anywhere from 5%. And, you know, we might see 20 plus percent in certain markets. And Crystal, you guys are both real estate investors and you help coach people through that process. What's been the biggest change, do you think, in the last couple of years? Because that has been a huge difference in real estate markets is the amount of investment going on. And also, is this a good time to invest in real estate? Absolutely. It's definitely changed over the last few years. It, part of it, I believe, is media Um you know, there's a lot more access than there ever was. So it's been extremely competitive. So what we've been seeing, and, and actually not even so much in California, it seems that investors are not flocking uh, like they do other in other states to California because of our landlord tenant laws. But in other states, what we're seeing is, you know, 20, 30, 40 offers on buildings. And I'm hearing from other buyers and investors that they're making offers on 50, 100, 150 buildings before they're getting offers accepted. So we have seen that shift this year as rates have risen. Many investors are kind of taking a back seat to see what happens. And as far as whether or not it's a good time to invest, my personal philosophy is that there are always deals out there. So my 
my kind of advice is the same is that you you have your criteria and what you're looking for and as long as the building meets that criteria then it's ab absolutely still a good time to invest well crystal how exactly do you find that perfect deal because i think many people might want to invest in real estate but they take a step back and say hey this is a heck of a lot of money things can change on a dime so how do you know when is the right time to really pull the trigger and jump in if that makes sense for you so as an example, for me as an investor, I'm looking at, let's say, a 5% return on market. So if I'm going to run all my numbers, especially in a market like this, where there's a little bit more rate volatility, that's where we're seeing deals fall apart as people's rates aren't locked and then rates go up and the deal doesn't make sense anymore. So what we are advising people to do and what we're doing ourselves is underwriting our deals with conservative analysis uh, based on interest rates going up. So let's say today's interest rate is maybe 4.5%. I'm going to underwrite it at a 5%, at a 6%, at a, even maybe even a 6.5% interest rate, just to make sure, you know, at what point does this deal not make any sense? At what point might I have to come back to the seller for a price reduction? So I want to have all those numbers laid out and have a pretty frank conversation with the broker about what our goals are and what we need to hit and what kind of volatility that we're, we're facing. Great stuff. Kenny, we want to close with some news the viewers can use. You have some tips for buyers and for sellers in this environment, what are they? Buyers, simple. Um, don't hesitate. Everybody's sitting on the sideline. They're waiting. Um, don't wait. If you see a house that's on the market for 30, 45, 60 days, it's because the seller's unrealistic. So they're either going to A, take it off the market, or B, lower the price, but just give them an offer. So what I'm seeing is, and we are seeing an uptick too, as summer comes to an end, everybody's back to school, is buyers are starting to get those reductions, whether that's in 5% off the list price or that's in paying closing costs. So my advice is, is get out there, make some offers, and you might have to make more offers. And don't worry about if you upset a seller because you know they think you're low volume because maybe that's the price they're going to have to live with. And if you're a seller, um, unfortunately for you, yeah, it's becoming a buyer's market. So if you're overlisted and you're sitting there, um, buyers are smart. You're probably just going to either have to lower the price or take it off the market. So if you're waiting for some miracle to happen, I don't think it's going to happen. It's just reality is this is the new market and we're going to have to accept it. Also with sellers is this is the time also if your house is not the nicest house on the block and you were able to get that price, you're going to take a bigger haircut than the guy down the street that has the newer remodeled house. And so you have to understand that and you got to really listen to your agents and trust their opinions and making sure you're working with the best. Dynamic certainly changing in the housing market. All right, Kenny Simpson, Crystal Moore. Thank Let's you. switch gears here and talk a little bit more about housing here and particularly the market because higher interest rates could be causing a slowdown in momentum for the U.S. housing market and the many, many stocks tied to the sector. Shares of KB Home and Toll Brothers, they're down 15% in just the past six months. That cool down is where we find Sazi's take today, perhaps in the pantry? <laughs> Perhaps in the pantry, Brad. Uh, ultimately, this note inspired by the uh, team over at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Chief economist Jan Hatzi is out with a very new note, uh, literally, this morning. New note, housing, saying, uh, looking for a couple things. First, uh, home sales, uh, he's looking for an annualized decline of 12% by the fourth quarter of this year. So not uh, a bullish note out by Hatzi and his team on housing by any stretch of the imagination. In that same vein, also looking for a, quote, sharp fall in uh, home prices, 8% uh, annualized increase in the third quarter for home prices. That is looking to slow, according to Hatzius, to 3% growth by the fourth quarter. And then guess what? By next year, Hatzius is expecting no increases uh, in home price, essentially for that market to stay flat for home prices. So that is worth noting. Uh, over a good chart from the team as well, just showing how far housing demand has fallen in recent months. Of course, we've seen weakness in existing and new home sales data over the past few months. And that chart really helps depict all that in large part because of those, fa uh, those first early rounds of rate hikes from the Federal Reserve pressuring housing. This is some commentary we heard from Toll Brothers when they reported earnings in their backlog numbers last week. Uh, and here's my take uh, to consider, given all of this negativity, there's me in the house I do not have. Nonetheless, reevaluate any positions you have in companies tied to housing's fortunes and do it now, now, now. This is not a buy or sell recommendation, of course. This is just a good opportunity or a good suggestion to go back into your portfolio. If you, are look, if you own shares of Home Depot, a Lowe's, a Toll Brothers, a Whirlpool, realize that second quarter results were not good. Guidance was not good. And with rates now 
going to uh, likely increase even further in the months ahead because of what the Fed is doing. That second quarter, uh, that second quarter uh, performance for a lot of these companies could look a heck of a lot worse and very soon. Yeah, I was just taking a look at the S&P 500 Home Builders ETF as well, XHB. It's actually down 28% to this point year to date. We've already seen the continued slippage in terms of the deliveries of these new homes and home builder confidence as well. And that continuing to be one of the major factors that is is really just showing how much the economy is also pricing in or just looking at and anticipating this continued slowdown in some of the home building and the actual deliveries of these homes. I was having a real time flashback as I often do with these takes, Brad. You know, I was thinking back to when I was a kid at my own, at my parents' house. I had to actually, when I mowed the lawn, put like a design like in the baseball field in the lawn. If I, I didn't do it correct, I wasn't getting dinner. I, it was just really disturbing. I got, disturbing childhood. I got taken off of lawnmower duty after I started doing. Well, crop you had a circles. job. You actually had a job. Oh well, 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 yeah, I did. But it, for my house, I did crop circles and crop everything. circles. Nice. Yeah, well, I'm you glad were, you, you got dinner. At least. The goal was to do it so bad that they wouldn't make you do it anymore. <laughs> no, <Yeah. it's> <laughs> September historically the worst month for stocks. Is this going to be any exception? Uh, you know, seasonality is always something to think about. You know, sell may go away, uh, or you know, we have a pres we have a midterm election, so we've got a political cycle going on. There's a lot of cycles, and you know, oftentimes I find investors only focusing on one cycle, like seasonality or the election or the inflation cycle or the business cycle. You really have to think about all of them together to really come up with a, a, a strong investment conclusion. So. Today, we've had a lot of different cycles between commodities, rates, the policy, housing. Um, and so uh, I, I think, yeah, it's going to be uh, a, a, another difficult month for the market, uh, especially after uh, Chairman Powell's pretty clear message that he gave about a week ago. Uh, we continue to see leading economic data around the world deteriorate. Uh, and today, with mortgage rates nearly back to the highs, uh, the worse housing gets, the worse the U.S. economy is going to get, and the worse the stock market is going to perform just to simplify it. So I do think so, yeah. Well, since Fed Chair Powell has made it clear that the Fed is not going to take its foot off the gas when it comes to tightening and height rigs, um, in terms of what you're expecting, in terms of an investment strategy at this point, when you do have so much economic data coming at you, what's the play here? Yeah. And so for economic data, it's really important to differentiate and understand which data are leading, which data are coincident and lagging. A lot of the pushback we get from more bullish investors today, and we are uh, we do have the, the, the lowest year end uh, number on the street of all strategists at thirty four hundred. So we get a lot of pushback, as you can imagine. Most of it is come is really regarding coincident and lagging economic economic data. Uh, such as loan growth is still strong, earnings are still okay, employment's still firm. All of that's true, but those are all lagging economic indicators. Things that lead those indicators consistently across time are telling us that you know the best days are behind us for those data and expect uh, that to continue to deteriorate. Mike, what's going to be the catalyst to change things around? Is it only inflation or are you looking at something else that would make you a little bit more bullish on your outlook for equities? More bullish. Um, I would say we'd have to see the beginning of a stabilization in the U.S. housing market because I have looked back at every single major correction, bear market, back to 1950, and it's very clear that you do not get the beginning of a new bull market until you start to see housing in the U.S. economy stabilize, which is the early, early part of the economy that first rebounds. So, for example, in 2019, when Powell pivoted, the end of the year, we saw the NHB index, builder sentiment, begin to recover immediately and go up 20 points in 2019. And that was a clear sign the U.S. economy was not heading into recession and that was going to start to recover. So with mortgage rates at their highs here, hard to really get uh, optimistic about housing in the U.S. Um, inflation coming down is good news. However, the lagged effect of the inflation we've already seen is still going to be weighing on the economy for the next several quarters. And then on top of that, we've got the Fed that's still aggressively raising interest rates. And I would argue outside of housing, we haven't even begun to see that. So, you know, from my perspective, the way our framework from a macro perspective looks at these markets, we believe that they continue to be a horrible risk reward. Horrible risk reward. Um, we haven't even begun to, the Fed, sell mortgage-backed securities. So how much worse might the housing sector get? 
Uh, well, if that keeps rates high, then, you know, again, there's just nothing that's going to allow it to improve. In 2019, the only issue we had regarding housing was high interest rates. You know, more uh, home prices were not ex uh, elevated like they are today. Uh, and so when, when rates came down, immediately we saw a big recovery. Today, we've got a much broader problem in the global economy. And so I think it would take a lot, even more than rates to coming down to get housing to recover because prices are still uh, really high affordability is pretty poor. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't think there's really many green shoots that uh, there are out there right now. And Mike, I want to talk earnings because in your note, you talked about the markings of an earnings driven bear market. How are we, make, we making that distinction versus other bear markets and how is that informing your outlook? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a really important nuance in this bear market that we have going on today, which is that really the first six months of the bear market, it wasn't about earnings. It really wasn't about the global economy collapsing. It was really about interest rates going up, inflation going up, and multiples being reset as a result of that. And that is not a familiar bear market to anyone who hasn't been investing for more than 40 years. So that's certainly me and uh, probably 95% of investors today. Uh, it, we, we, we've gone through and we are in the middle of an inflation and interest rate driven bear market which is very different from what we saw ultimately in 2000 and 2008, which was a, uh, an earnings bear market. Earnings estimates have peaked. They peaked ironically in the middle of June, right, run, right the same time where the market bottomed. Uh, and so I, could, you know, I would actually argue that uh, that rally we saw in June, July into mid-August was, was ironically a result of, or, or in other words, the market was kind of celebrating the onset of a recession in that the market was celebrating weak data because it meant potentially less Fed rate hikes, um, and, and oil has you know collapsed pretty hard, probably because we're starting to see demand dry up uh, and economic data slow. So ironically, the rally was really about bad data, which you know is kind of counterintuitive, uh, which is why it also doesn't last. So earnings uh, expectations are still way too high. I don't think that's. Um, unusual or out of consensus at all. We've been saying that all year and pretty much most people are saying it today. The earnings estimate for 2023 as of right now is $243.76. We think that estimate is gonna fall about another 6% by year end to about $230. And as that takes place, we think there's also gonna be pressure on the market multiple as we see credit spreads widen and the employment data deteriorate. So that's how we get to our 3,400 year end target uh, at about a 15 to 16 multiple times uh, 230 estimates for next year. Now we don't think that's the low or nor do we think that's what earnings are gonna be. We just think that's where consensus will be at the end of this year. Hey, Mike, real quick, while we got you, we have to talk about Bitcoin, right? We've been watching the slide that we've seen in crypto. Today though, we're seeing Bitcoin back above 20,000. Do you think there's more downside risk and how big of a, drop, of a drop could we potentially see? Yeah, you know, I'm not a big uh, Bitcoin fanatic. It's not really part of my wheelhouse. But about, a, about two years ago, I uh, observed that Bitcoin was basically trading exactly like uh, the relative performance of high to low beta stocks. So it's essentially a beta trade. And that relationship has been locked tight really for the last two years or so. Uh, and so that means it's a macro trade because beta is a macro factor. And so we're very bearish on high beta stocks until we see a bottoming in leading economic indicators like the NHB index and the ISM index. And so anything that looks, walks, talks uh, like beta, Bitcoin is a clear example, is something we want to definitely avoid. Uh, and so we've seen a bit of a stabilization in things like Bitcoin and beta in this market rally that's, I think, over. Uh, and that's why we're beginning to see uh, more pain ahead. So I said, uh, we published many, many months ago that uh, I think Bitcoin is around 40,000, that we're going to probably see it getting cut, get cut in half and then some. And then we reiterated that recently. So, you know, I could easily see it falling down to 15,000. Again, it's not a long-term view on Bitcoin at all. It's purely a cyclical view with, with the um, realization that it's trading exactly like the market today. So until we see a bottom in the economy, I don't think- One real estate firm is betting big on the return to office. Workspace Property Trust has acquired a majority stake in 53 suburban office buildings. And that's the key. The $1.1 billion transaction beefs up a portfolio that now includes properties in 14 of the top 20 U.S. metropolitan areas. 
Workspace Property Trust co-founder, chairman, and CEO, Tom Risk, joining us now. Tom, good to see you. Courage, they say, is running into a burning building when others are running out. Why is this a good time to invest in office space? Well, you have to distinguish between suburban office space and CBD or downtown office space. We believe that the demographic shift is really moving to the suburbs and the pandemic just accelerated that. Uh, we're seeing that in our numbers. Uh, we're, we're seeing increased leasing velocity. Uh, this quarter, we have the largest pipeline of leasing activity in the suburbs than we've had in a few years. Um, we feel that at the end of the day, the suburbs are the big winner coming out of the pandemic. And so you will see us continue to invest aggressively in the suburbs uh, for, the, for those headline reasons. Well, Tom, not all suburbs obviously are equal. Those high growth markets, what are they? How are you defining those areas? Well, um, I guess high growth markets uh, tend to be reflective of things like tax structure, lower tax states, uh, demographics, increase in population. Uh, you, you see that in several different markets across the country. Uh, and in those cases, you know, you've got, I guess, a decade ago, you saw millennials driving the market to the cities. People said millennials will live, work, and play in the city. The suburbs will suffer. Now the opposite's happening. The millennials are having children. They're moving to the suburbs. And now they don't want to get on a subway. They don't want to get on an elevator with 25 stories. They prefer to be close to home. It is a good sort of a medium solution or moderate solution to, I don't want to work at home, but I don't want to be in the city. And so we're seeing population growth uh, taxes being sort of two of the high high profile uh, factors in growth markets. Well, Tom, I'm curious to get your thoughts on because in the second quarter, we saw Denver, Charlotte, Washington, D.C., Seattle, among those downtown submarkets that recorded the biggest increases in vacancy during Q2. Taking a look at some of those other cities, obviously, Austin, Fort Lauderdale, Las Vegas, Miami, Atlanta, we're on the opposite side of the spectrum. But taking a look at the cities, I guess, that see the highest vacancy in downtown. Are those the areas that are seeing the most demand for the suburban offices? Does that make sense? Well, maybe. They're not necessarily related. They can be related. So uh, if, you look at, um, if you look at the vacancy rates in general, this is the first time in over a decade that the vacancy rate in the suburbs is lower than in the cities. Okay, they're not necessarily related. I still think we're talking about those markets in general, what are the demographics going there? What state are they in? What's the tax structure? What's the cost of living? Um, but you are seeing some of that. You're seeing, even in the, what I'll call growth markets, you mentioned Austin, um, you'll see some decrease in, in occupancy in the downtowns and some corresponding increase in the suburbs. And to take it a step further, there's going to be some permanent shift of occupancy from the cities to the suburbs, we think, as a result of the pandemic. And so you're going to, you're going to see even better numbers. So, Tom, how permanent do you think that shift is going to be and, and how much will be left? Obviously, as a lot of people return back to the office, a lot more companies are asking people to come back. And once that sort of commute kicks in and people are like, hmm, maybe I should be back in the city. Are you concerned at all that sort of after the pandemic sort of normalizes that people might want to actually be in some of these downtown offices? Well, um, we don't we think first of all, we do think the downtown office space is going to rebound. Okay, I want to make sure we, we say that. But having said that, we think the shift to the suburbs of some occupancy will be permanent. Uh, people are making, we think the people for the first time in a long time are really focusing on their quality of life. Uh, we like to focus on, you know, live, work and balanced. Uh, and, and we think that that's really going to drive the day. We don't think they're going to go back. We think there'll be some permanent decisions made. We think there's a demand for more space because they don't want to have people as crowded in the office space. It used to be six bodies per thousand. It's going to go back to three and a half bodies per thousand, which is where we were 20 years ago. So we think the shift is permanent. Tom, how important are amenities when it comes to these new suburban buildings? And a really quick one. If I told you I had a sweet deal on a New York office building, the number one market in the country, you'd tell me what? We, we, we are not investors in, in the cities. Uh, we think, you know, there's going to be some continued turbulence. 
uh, in the occupancy rates, then we would not be an investor there. You mentioned what about you know what about amenities? Amenities are extremely important in the suburbs. You have to be able, even more than that. The entire environment it has to be a live, work, play environment. It has to have a lot of retail opportunities. It, ha it has to have everything you can think of from from you know, workout uh, uh, locations. They want the folks want everything. And if you have a lower quality building where you just don't have the amenities, well, those buildings are going to suffer whether or not. They're in the suburbs. It's been a shocking turnaround after two years of extreme bidding wars. The housing market has started to cool off. Yet, as rising mortgage costs and home prices push many prospective buyers to the sidelines, the inevitable comparisons of the 2008 housing bubble and predictions of another housing market crash, they've started to swirl. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero for more on why the housing market isn't facing a repeat of 2008. Why not? So the housing market is definitely better off today than it was 15 years ago. And that's thanks to the lending regulations that we now have in place. So that means that fewer homeowners are at risk of defaulting if prices do fall. We did see, though, economists at Goldman Sachs say that trouble is ahead in the housing market. Uh, they're predicting that home sales will fall even further through the end of the year. Now, while that could, you know, definitely trigger some bells and whistles, this market it really is a different one than the last one. Borrowers are on a better, have a better footing. Uh, if just take a look at mortgage delinquencies, they're low. Nearly 3% of mortgages were passed due in July. Foreclosures are also down 25% from June, according to Black Knight data. Um, but with these interest rate hikes, mortgage rates have definitely been on a wild ride these past this past month, bouncing between 5.4% to 5.8%. So that has really caused mortgage demand to pull back. Applications for home loans, as you can see on your screen, fell 3.7% last week compared to the previous week. And this has also caused a pullback in refinancing activity as well, which is highly sensitive to these rate uh, weekly rate moves. Um, but due to the rise in mortgage rates, that means that home buying is more expensive. So affordability has dipped to its lowest level since 1989. Um, and there's still low supply for homes. Many home, many Americans are really are playing the waiting game right now when it comes to buying a new constructed home um, as demand really accelerated during the pandemic. If we take a look at those numbers, home listings are lower than pre-pandemic levels. New listings, which includes uh, the first ones that go onto the market, that declined 2.8% nationwide from the last uh, year. So relief could be on the way. Um, you know, there are some forecasts that mortgage rates are going to decline next year, according to Fannie Mac uh, forecasts. But again, it is important to note that borrowers are have a strong financial footing this time around than good, last. Good point on, on waiting now. And why not? You know, that Goldman port, report you mentioned, they're looking for no price growth in homes next year. They actually they said zero. So why not just sit back and wait? I mean, are you buying a home? I'm not. I'm not. I'm waiting it out. I'm waiting it out. And why not? Yeah. We also saw new listings for home sales, for new listings of homes for sale. They fell 15% year over year. That according to some data from Redfin. Um, and that's for the four weeks ending in August 21st. So a lot of data to really encapsulate where the state of the market is at. Right now. And, and I think that's also the big thing about the housing market. There's just so much data out there that you're like, which one is more than, you know, which one matters more than the other. But again, it goes back to that strong financial footing that these borrowers have. So we're not going to see that. You're that. all invited to my my barbecue when I buy my house. All yes. of you. All of you. Oh, wow. All of you. Traeger or Weber? I'm going Traeger. I want to go with the smoke grill, and I like to control it with my phone. Is a cooling housing sector evidence of Fed success? Data from Redfin out today showing homes are selling below their list price for the first time since March of 2021. Hassam Naji is the CEO of Marcus and Millichap. He joins us now. Good to see you, sir. So 30,000 foot view. We're going to get to commercial real estate in a moment. What are you seeing in the residential side? Are we seeing just the cooling? Is there any similarities to 08, 09? Great to be with you on the program. Thanks for having me. If you step back, the biggest difference is the fact that the system is not sick. We don't have a fractured banking system, an illiquid banking system, and uh, way too much speculation on loans that were about to default in very, very large volumes back in 08, 09. 
those conditions are not present in today's market. We had this incredible surge because of the liquidity that was injected in the system, record low interest rates because of the pandemic. All of that came together. And the fact that society was changing, people were you know, expanding their homes, moving to the suburbs because they could work virtually, uh, all of which is very different than 08, 09, but nonetheless resulted in a big surge in prices, big surge in activity. And we're now taking that away. Basically, things are coming back to earth. You see sales are down 20% year over year. Prices are still up about 10%, which is cooling. And we've just now begun a, a, a period of leveling off and, and correcting back to a very healthy base, unlike 08, 09. Well, Sam, you talk about coming back to earth, getting back to that healthy base. Goldman was out with an interesting note earlier this week, basically saying that the housing market downturn is going to get worse next year. We are far from reaching the bottom. When we get to that bottom, what does that look like? I guess, how big of a pullback are you expecting to see? Well, it will be a, it will be a significant pullback from the peak that we've just recently witnessed in the last uh, 12 months or so. But what we have to remember is that in the last two years, home prices jumped on average 20% a year, or about 40% from pre-pandemic levels. That's unprecedented. The closest we've ever seen on an annual average uh, is the 2010 to 2019 economic cycle, where the average uh, annual price gain was 5.7%. So it was completely unusual, very unprecedented. Therefore, it's gonna be a big percentage pullback. But again, if you look at a long-term chart, we're not looking at significant declines or discounts to where we were pre-pandemic, just getting back to where probably where we were pre-pandemic in a lot of the metros. Metros like Phoenix, Austin, Atlanta, Charlotte, they saw prices jump as much as 50% in, in a two year time period. So there will be a painful correction. But the good news is that the rental market is at an all time peak in demand. People are opting to rent more than ever affordability of single family homes has become another reason why the rental market is so strong. And uh, we're, we're not facing a collapse of non-performing loans, which exacerbated the problem in 08, 09. And so we're seeing that the data is showing that one in five home sellers now dropping their asking price as the market cools. Obviously, a lot of people also went into to rentals while they couldn't get into some of this inventory. But where are we in this curve then of normalcy? And what are you seeing regionally as well? Well, I believe there will be a couple of quarters of this continued adjustment in both sales and prices, as you just cited. It's not surprising to see those statistics. I think we're going to see more of them. This correction will take a, a few quarters before it begins to level off. The other safety net that's out there, both for housing and commercial real estate, really is the job market. We've added over 6 million jobs in the last 12 months, and people have become much more mobile because of the ability to work virtually. And so that gives uh, the, the marketplace a lot, of, uh, a lot of flexibility. Markets that are creating jobs, the job leaders in particular, uh, are not gonna see as much of a, a home price correction. And the other side of it is that the supply uh, volume is still well below where demand has been. So we're not overbuilding both housing and commercial real estate, all of which are positives, but they don't, they don't eliminate the short-term adjustment and some pain to go from these incredible peaks we had post-pandemic to much more of a normalized market. You mentioned that remote work, which for tens of thousands comes to an end next week as a lot of companies begin to pull back employees to the office. With that, I wanna ask you about the commercial outlook, in particular in office space. Now I know all real estate is local, but given that those numbers really have plateaued in terms of return to office, what is the outlook on the commercial and office space environment? Sure, with well, the commercial real estate industry has so many different variations. You have apartment buildings that are part of the business that are great investment vehicles, shopping centers, uh, self-storage units. You have uh, the hospitality industry, ho you know, hotels, mobile home parks. It's a really diverse industry. So when we talk about commercial space, most people think of office. And of course, office is the property type that is feeling the most pain because of the fact that uh, people are not coming back into the office. Our office clients that own buildings across the US are reporting maybe 50% occupancy levels by their tenants at this time. The good news is those tenants are still paying rent because they have an obligation to. The question is what happens when those leases roll over in the next three to four years? We will see a shrinkage of footprint. Uh, we will see a shrinkage of demand. We're seeing it as we speak because of the hybrid work environment. Once we get this current uncertainty regarding how 
much of a recession we're going to have. Are we going to have from adding three to 500,000 jobs in the last two months to losing jobs? We may experience some job losses actually before the Fed is done fighting inflation. And what does that do to demand? In the short term, the office space is definitely going to feel the pain. So on a longer term basis, once we get past the current recession concern and then economic cycle per, you know, follows it, you're going to see new demand. You're going to see new companies form. You're going to see new uh, expansion plans by companies. That's probably three to four years off. And in the meantime, I think there will be a valuation adjustment and a rental adjustment. Suburban office space has relatively rebound, but it's those big cities that are struggling. On that note, I, I shot some video at the Seagram building right here in New York City, an iconic building on Park Avenue. They put $25 million into the development you're seeing on your screen. Pickleball, weightlifting, cycling, you name it, a giant theater. Is that what it's going to take, those type of amenities in those major cities? You know, you just nailed it. The silver lining of the pain we're talking about is the reconfiguration of the use of space, making it more experiential and actually attracting the next generation of workers into a collaborative team environment, physical presence because of some of these amenities. We've seen it in retail. The retail segments that are doing extremely well, surprisingly well, are those that are experiential. Post pandemic, when restaurants open back up, fitness centers open back up, movie theaters open back up, you, you saw a surge of that experience desire by consumers. The same is true in the office uh, side of the equation. All right, Hassam Naji, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate it.